I think this is a good time to kind of go back to kind of basics of, of building a fan basis. Right. So mm-hmm. it's like in this time, if you're not working on that stuff, focus on gathering emails. How, how, how are you ga- gathering a fan basis? How are you gathering email addresses? How are you connecting with your fans, making sure that you're staying engaged, making sure that you're doing everything to, you know, kind of, do a bit of spring cleaning essentially while, sure. you know, while, while you're not doing much else, I think it's important to, to have those, you know, foundations and, and basis. And then on top of that, um, you know, I, I would say going back and writing great music, you know, honing your craft. If it, if, if you're not comfortable with, or don't have an ability to really monetize, you know, any sort of outward thing, Spend this time making the best music of your career. What's going on? Welcome to the New Music Business Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book. Today on the show is Marshall Betts. He is an agent, formerly of Paradigm, but after Paradigm practically or actually literally dissolved its entire music division and laid off hundreds of employees, Marshall Betts, along with a few of his co-workers at Paradigm, launched a new agency, TBA. Get it? (laughs) TBA Agency. Uh, They got a lot of press when they first came out of the gates, but they just launched September 1st, 2020. Now, they took their roster with them, so they've hit the ground running. Their current roster includes The War on Drugs, Courtney Barnett, Churches, Hot Chip, Toon Yards, Guided by Voices, Cut Copy, Jose Gonzalez, Beirut, Tycho, Toro E. Moy, Pink Martini, Caribo, Hiatus Coyote, and Madam Gandhi, who we actually had on the show a few months ago, just to name of the few artists. Marshall and I talk everything about the live concert market from when he thinks it's going to come back in the traditional sense in clubs and outdoor amphitheaters and that kind of stuff, all the way to what's happening right now and what agents' jobs are right now. And he discusses ticketed live streams. We talk about driving concerts and what he looks for when he wants to sign artists. He talks about, you know, it's not just about the numbers. Now, I've had uh, agents as guests in the past, and I've interviewed tons and tons of booking agents and to kind of hear what they have to say. And I was actually encouraged a little bit by what Marshall had to say of what he looks for in artists. And it's not always about their numbers. Fancy that. Somebody in the music industry doesn't just look at your numbers. Amazing. Yeah, he talked about, he told the story of how he found, uh, he signed Courtney Barnett when she was just playing cafes in Melbourne, Australia, way back in the day, long before she was selling out venues that she is selling out now and the major festivals that she's playing. As always, please subscribe, like this show, follow this show, however you're listening to it. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, uh, Pause this right now if this is if you listen to a bunch of episodes and please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really, really helps if you dig the show. Reviews really help. Sign up on the email list. Super important. You want to be on that email list. This is where we send out all the information about upcoming episodes, but more importantly, what's happening in the music industry. You know, we release episodes weekly, but things happen in the music industry, and I write a bunch of different blogs and comparison articles, any kind of advocacy work that we're working on that you need to know about. I send an email out about that. So sign up on the email list. You can find that at ariestake.com. Also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Ari Herstant, or you can find all of us at Ari's Take. All right, let's kick into the show. Marshall Betts, welcome to the show. Thank you. (laughs) Where where are you excited to be here? Yeah, Uh, where where are you right now? We're in Brooklyn, or I'm in Brooklyn right now. Right. The we, the royal we right now, the collective we. Yeah. Uh, we don't really know what that means these days. <laughs> we are all one, right? Just getting through yeah. the shit show that is 2020, I guess. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> um, you've been in Brooklyn, I guess, New York for a while, or how long have you been there? I've been in New York uh, for over 10 years. Um, I'm originally from Washington, D.C. Um, okay. I went to school in Philly and yeah, moved to New York about probably 12 years ago. At this okay. point, 12, 13 years ago. Um, so yeah, long time. Well, not until, that long, but 
Yeah, no, that. no, that's a long time. I've been in LA for 10 <laughs> years. So I, I feel like LA, I feel like an LA native now being here 10 years. So I imagine, yeah. you know, that that's, that's a marker that, that is a milestone. I don't know what the milestone is, but it's, it's <laughs> a milestone, I guess. Um, so up until 2020, um, would you say New York has still been a hub of music i mean you're there so there's definitely something happening and been happening there but you know at least on the artist side i and and the manager side i've been hearing over the last decade uh that people have kind of i don't know a bit of the industry has been leaving new york this is the kind of just word on the street for la and nashville what is your take on just kind of what has happened with the new york music scene and Um, industry in general there's certainly still an industry here. I mean, when we were at Paradigm, uh, the probably the largest music division in uh, at the whole company was still based in New York. Uh, certainly the largest collection of agents. Um, I, I could be wrong based on numbers, but um, it felt that way at least. And, cool. um, you know, there's still a, a decent sub subsect of people that, you know, operate out of New York um that have you know lived here and uh do things you know a new yorker way but i will say that for sure there was and has been a large migration um from new york to la in the past um in the past decade as you alluded to certainly a lot of people that used to live here that um uh, i knew and worked with um moved over there Hmm. uh i think to be honest, most of the time it had to do with real estate. Um, I, I'm not sure, sure right. it necessarily had to do with uh, the music industry, um, but you know, I think I think a, a big thing to consider certainly was the consolidation of at least in the you know industry side, mm-hmm. the consolidation of the of large independent agencies into corporate you know talent agencies, um, and um, you know most of most of the larger corporate agencies also are very steeped in film and TV and all that stuff, which is obviously just much more heavily based out of LA. So you have headquarters in LA um, Mm -hmm. for CAA paradigm ended up having a big headquarters. Um, Obviously Rowan Morris has a big office there in UTA and um, you know, a, a lot of the other larger ones. So as things were consolidating and those companies were buying up other divisions, Mm-hmm. Um, they certainly encouraged people to be at their biggest office because, you know, that was beneficial to them and, and everybody yeah. else. So, so I, well, that's I mean, actually yeah. a, a good jumping off point because uh, you were at Paradigm for and, and before that you were at Windish. So you went yes. with Tom, uh, Tom Windish over from when you guys were just the Windish agency over to Paradigm. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was at an agency called Pinnacle um, with four, which, which had four or five different agents. Um, And it was a small operation, but we worked on some pretty large clients, everybody from um, Alice Cooper to Mastodon and Robin Oasis um, and some things like that. But again, it was just four or five of us. And we actually weren't even in the city. We were in Westchester um, up near White Plains and Mm -hmm. Uh, after being there for a couple of years, um, I, or all, a few of us were approached by Tom to potentially join the Windish agency. Um, and we went there, uh, and that was, um, probably eight or nine years ago at this point. And, okay. uh, and then worked there till the Windish agency was acquired by Paradigm and then obviously Paradigm till 2020. Yeah. So let's start there. Uh, parad- uh, COVID happens, shuts down the entire live music industry. Everybody is freaking the fuck out. And, you know, we all read the press releases and saw the billboard articles of Paradigm, you know, uh, initially laying off 200 people right away. And then like, well, we're right. just carrying them back, blah, 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 blah. We don't know what's happening. No one in the agency world, I feel like really that I've spoken to, um, has really known what to do. I talked to a friend of mine who's an agent um, and he's like, my entire job consists of booking dates and canceling them. And every day I'm just booking, canceling, canceling, booking. <laughs> and because we got to keep moving, you know, the, the marker of when, when we think live music is right. coming back. So, so tell me about what happened 
Um, you were at Paradigm, and then tell me what you did now getting into TBA. Yeah. So, I mean, Paradigm certainly was, you know, of the larger corporate agencies, um, the first one to uh, to to lay pe- to have a massive layoff. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, those layoffs had kind of been happening at the company. They had laid off people, I think, uh, a few months prior in January, a, a de- mm-hmm. like a decent amount of people. Wow. There were talks about, or at least throughout the industry, about selling Paradigm to another company, kind of in a much larger consolidation. Um, and um, so basically, at Paradigm, thing like people, a lot of people losing their job was not necessarily a new thing. <laughs> oh, <gosh>. um, okay. <laughs> and um, but what was new was the pandemic, and um, and. I mean, I was uh, the week before the office, the New York office shut down. I was in Vancouver for a show. One of my artists was supporting the Strokes in Vancouver. Cool. And then I had another band playing in San Francisco and I flew back. And um, I remember getting in the Uber from Newark and talking with the Uber driver. And the Uber driver was basically like convinced that the pandemic or COVID wasn't a real thing. And to be honest, she, uh, like the majority of people were in that mindset at that point. It was, you know, something fairly temporary, wasn't going to be that bad. And, uh, and again, like our company was still allowing people to travel, not only, you know, in the United States, but abroad Mm. and all that kind of stuff. And I went back to the office for one day. I had a show the next night on the Thursday and it was sold out and great. And on the Friday, we got a notice from our office manager saying, office is shut down. Do not come. Like, um, you know, from now on, you will be working from home for the foreseeable future, at least for a few weeks. Yeah. Weekend goes by. Then um, then we get a call from the head. I got a call from the head of our office kind of saying, things don't look good. Um, Mm -hmm. we don't really know what's going to happen. No one really knows, but it's not looking good. And that week was when South by got canceled, when, um, ultra got canceled. It was Mm -hmm. kind of like the first marker. I don't think Coachella had been canceled yet, but a lot of the big festivals in early spring were kind of like going down. Yeah. And, um, by Friday of that week, one week from when the office shut down, um, several hundred employees were laid off. Uh, wow. So they lasted one week yeah. um, and, you know, immediately caught a bunch of people and said, uh, they turned off our emails. They said, mm-hmm. um, you're supposed to maintain your relationships with your managers and your clients, even though you don't have access to your email, you will not be, you will not have any pay um, and you will not have health insurance as of the end of the month which was two weeks away. Holy shit. And um, so naturally the first thing, because that pretty much I think most of the agents went through, but specifically me, because I had been through a few different agencies where I knew basically when you change agencies, not only does it kind of filter throughout the whole industry, but like other agents, other managers, they start to get wind. And because your clients aren't legally tied to you, the first natural instinct as an agent is to hold on to your clients, make sure that they are doing okay, um, and everything like that. So that day was and weekend was pretty much kind of uh, comprised of reaching out to managers, letting them know what happened. I mean, trying to figure out truly what was going on in the world. And then on Mm -hmm. top of that, like kind of, and the secondary part, a financial, personal financial situation. Do you have your Jerry and, Maguire moment where you're on the phone and everything's okay? I mean, yeah, it really was like that. And, yeah. you know, I don't think people were necessarily trying to poach our clients, but you didn't know because, I mean, look, all, there were so many of us. Yeah. There was a text message chain between, I think, something like 50 agents and all of us and just listening one by one, getting the call and going, I'm gone, I'm gone. I'm gone. 
have gone. And watching the names go down and high profile people, big agents with big clients and, you know, newer agents and everything like that. So once the dust settled the next week, I think all those agents and, and people started to kind of get together and say, okay, what just happened? Is it legal that what just happened? Um, you know, what can we do? How can we salvage our relationships with our clients? And how should we start to mitigate this between paradigm and ourselves? Mm-hmm. And I think the next kind of month, month and a half, especially as press was being leaked and released about paradigm and how they were handling things, things started to kind of coalesce and a clearer picture of how the industry was going to move forward started to form. COVID started to seem pretty real beyond the fall. Um, all the agents, you know, kind of retained most of their clients. And then it was more of a, okay, who might be offering jobs? Who wants to still be in the industry? What are people going to be doing with their clients? And, you know, in what ways can you move forward? And in that instance, I started having immediately conversations, not only with the people at TBA, but other agencies, seeing how they were doing, how they, you know, were coping with COVID and the idea that shows might not happen till fall of this year, um, which seems ridiculous at this point. Um, But, um, you know, everybody was just kind of like, okay, let's reschedule stuff for the fall. So then everybody was keeping busy and all that kind of stuff. And in the meantime, I have had longstanding relationships with the four other partners at TBA. And, you know, we had kind of formed a close knit group as kind of like a support group and people that we were talking to and doing things with. And this you know, is that, that Avery McTaggart, Amy Davidman, Ryan Craven and, and Devin Lando. Yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, we, we, we all came from the Windish agency. Um, a few of them were there just before I got there. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, Devin was there at the end to kind of tail end of it. But mm-hmm. we've all been working together for several, several years. And all in the New York us. office? No, they're actually all in the LA office. Okay. Um, but we, we are all close. And so we formed a little kind of close knit support group that, you know, kind of quickly formed into an idea, um, which, uh, you know, eventually coalesced into what, you know, comprises TBA today. Um, And, uh, and it's been great. Um, The whole way, you know, Mm -hmm. I think I'm, we all feel lucky that, um, that what transpired, transpired actually transpired, because we wouldn't be here doing something that truly feels great if it hadn't um you know we would have all been tied up in contracts and different sorts of things and certainly would have been harder and the industry would be different and and there wouldn't have been this opening on the other side you know it is a scary time to start a business especially in live music but you know a lot of great things have come from times during this out of necessity absolutely absolutely and and we really feel like there is such an opportunity to service our clients and future clients in such a different and better way and um so far the industry and you know our artists and managers have all reacted extremely positively to cool. you know our announce and everything and and it's been great awesome so um I love the name TBA. <laughs> uh, it's so fitting, so apt. Um, so, is it just the five of you right now, or are you bringing on more agents, or kind of where is it at right now? There's eleven. There's eleven people at the company right now. Um, okay. There's five partners. There's an uh-huh. additional agent, Josh Mulder, who recently came from Paradigm as well. Um, we have a head of marketing, a head of artist creative strategy a head of operations, and then two people in administrative roles. Cool. Amazing. Now, how is this being, I mean, with all live music shut down, you don't, I would imagine you don't have much of a revenue stream happening. Uh, How are you funding this with all the staff members? Do you have investors? What's the 
that is amazing. We have investors, um, which we have been lucky enough to find people that believe in what we're doing. Um, cool. But I will also say that, you know, you would be surprised about the the income that is actually coming in from alternative sources. Um, hmm. You know, there's a lot there's a lot of work to be done. And I think that there is this kind of collective at a lot of agencies and, you know, that are in different, I shouldn't say agencies, amongst some agents at agencies, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that um, are kind of sitting back and just waiting for things to come around. And, you know, there, look, there's a total, totally viable reason for that. And that's because no one really actually knows when things will come back. Right. And so there is a lot of spinning of wheels, but in the meantime, you know, we are going out there and finding creative new ways for our clients to not only make money, but enhance their time off, essentially, you know, focus on getting more revenue streams or introducing them to brands or potentially being in, you know, interactive with the election coming up, you know, things like that. So, So you know. I want to actually talk about that specifically. Uh, what are the things that you're doing with your artists that are bringing in some revenue? What What is happening these days? Well, there, I mean, first and foremost, there is just a massive influx in what I'm sure you're aware of is in ticketed live streams, right? And, sure. you know, there were a few early adapters that seemingly had some success. And now a lot of venues secondary ticketing markets, all these people are coming out of the woodwork saying, hey, we can do that too. Okay. Um, and I think it's a mix of finding artists, not only not necessarily having expendable income uh, anymore, or it kind of going into a few months too long to where they want you know, to make some money, but also mm-hmm. I think there's just a lot of artists out there that really want to play live again or yeah. get together with some people and express their art and you know they've been sitting around and really just want to do some interesting things so you know we have this great duo of of people that our company at our company um one who's the head of marketing and the other one is who's the head of artist creative strategy and they're sitting down with our artists and they're saying what are you interested in you know what you know what are the things beyond music that you like to do that, you know, that you might have interest in doing and how can we go about helping you do that? And in some ways, you know, it becomes monetized, um, you know, and somebody might say, my favorite brand of jeans, I don't know, is Levi's or something. Mm -hmm. And we're in talks with Levi's and so we help do that. But in another instance, it might be somebody that is particularly, you know, um, politically oriented and we find ways to go and help them set up and be part of nonprofit organizations that are helping spread, you know, the word about getting out the vote and things like that, that might be able to set up honorariums in order to help artists pay for costs for production and things like that. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's just, I, I, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say, so you have brand partnerships, uh, ticketed live streams. I'm actually curious about the ticketed live streams uh, component of it. Are you working with any companies specifically that you can talk to or have you created something in-house or what are the mechanics of how ticketed live streams are working for your artists right now? There's, so I mean, there are literally probably, I would assume now, hundreds of different ticketed live stream options. You know, every, sure. like venues all over the United States, all over the world. Then there's platforms like Noon Chorus and, and Drift and things like that. And I mean, so many B app and, and so many things like that. So th- there's really a plethora of stuff for artists to choose from out there. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's really whether or not an artist, like let's say an artist just says, I'm down to play a couple songs um, on some app that is ticketed. That's part of a monthly prescription or a subscription series that might have some sponsors. They get thrown a couple bucks and they're happy to do that. Mm-hmm. Some artists say, I really want to put a bunch of money into production and create this wonderfully looking great experience and sell it on my website so that not only can people buy tickets to watch me live in this incredible setting, but they can buy my merch, they can sign up to my email, they can mm-hmm. do all this stuff. So there's all sorts of different different ways to basically go about it. And each one offers a different 
way of going about it and offers sure. like maybe a slightly different thing and no, this person might, you know, have a link directly that can go to this or that, or, mm -hmm. you know, or provide more production services or things like that. Um, is that, so what are, uh, some of the deals, I guess, that are happening, you know, is this like when you said maybe the artist goes live with a couple songs on an app, I'm assuming they'll just throw them a guarantee. You show up, you do your thing. Uh, I would assume, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the ticketed streams from their website directly where they're, uh, you're working with the service, I would imagine that's fairly white labeling this where you just embed something on the site or, or maybe they send them to a different, um, you know, paywall kind of a, a thing. Um, and that would, I would assume after transaction fees and whatever the service fee for the, the company that's putting this together, then the artist is keeping the rest of that. Um, are there any favorite platforms for that kind of self-hosted stuff you're working with or like kind of dig into that a little bit more too, the deals? Those deals all differ. Um, most of them are set up kind of like you had suggested where you kind of name the ticket price mm -hmm. and we're talking about basically artist hosted ones, right? Where okay. they're, they're selling it to their all you know their email fan base their mm -hmm. subscription people or or whatever and so normally what it is is the um the host um will then go provide some promotional materials but then most of the time if the artist is paying you know for their production and everything mm -hmm. like that um they just get a certain amount you know of it what well, like a facility fee basically a small amount on top for processing that that ticket um okay. and then the artist keeps the rest which is obviously a net based on the production costs for sure um you know for the event um there are some ones that are willing to then go and say okay we'll put up the money for the production mm. we'll give you this amount um and then uh and then it's more of a split in the ticket price right you mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. there once you do that then we do 50 50 on the mm -hmm. ticket price um cool. so there's a bit of a risk on the quote unquote platforms part in that they're putting up the money based on how many tickets they think they'll sell but mm -hmm. ultimately they get a higher percentage of the actual ticket price beyond that which you know sure. some more money it takes a little what? bit of risk off the artist in that sense as well yep and when you're talking production uh break that down for me a little bit what our productions looking like these days and and i imagine you know the crews can't be that big just for safety reasons but what are the production costs and specifically what is production looking like for these live streams production costs are basically you got to hire a film crew which also okay. then comes lighting um and then the venue um and you know uh if you're you're bringing in all your sound um mm -hmm. you know sound engineers the actual you know capturing a, of it all i mean mm -hmm. you can go as bare bones as you want and you can put up a iphone camera in a, a tiny rock club and pay 200 bucks and you know just like broad stream right. that you could be sitting in a in a studio that has high-end sound and you just go right into the board and maybe have a handheld camera that's a little bit more hd Sure. Or you can do something like Nick Cave, where you go into a 5,000 capacity venue and he's playing a piano, but it's like beautifully produced and there's clearly a huge crew and all that kind of stuff and makes it more like a movie event, essentially. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and you cool. can literally, I, I mean, you can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on that kind of stuff if you yeah. want, or nothing at all. And it really just depends on the artist and, and what they want to do and how much they want to spend and the content that they like to create. Uh, our marketing person has said that they have seen the best results from people that um, spend, you know, more on production, make it more of an interesting, you know, uh, event um, mm -hmm. that seems kind of, I don't want to say once in a lifetime, but yeah. you know, as more people do these ticketed live streams, they want something that stands out a little bit more. So if it looks like you're getting to watch this artist and have this unique experience with them in, you know, 
in this amazing space, then, you know, they're going to have to spend a bunch of money to create that vibe, or at least most of the time they will. How do you make that exciting and interesting more so than just you're watching uh, a live concert on YouTube? Uh, like what makes it special and different is the artist, uh, the ones that you've seen or the most successful ones are the ones that have gone the best. Is there a chat box? Are they interacting with people in real time? Like what, what are some interesting tactics uh, that people are doing that, may, that's, that justifies the ticket price? Well, I mean, I, I, there's so many contributing factors. I mean, some artists are producing this content all the time, right? And mm -hmm. so that seemingly the audience starts to, I, from our experience, the people that have kind of made one big event actually end up selling the most tickets out of, you know, seemingly one special concert, right? As opposed to, multiple live streams and kind of wearing out not necessarily your fan basis but asking people to come back multiple times mm -hmm. or spreading it out amongst a, a bunch of dates a lot of a lot of success has also been seen based on the time of day and uh when you are holding these you know um if you when's can the hit, best time of day if you can hit um if you can hit kind of later in the day, um, mm -hmm. but not too late so that either people are just getting, you know, done with their zoom calls for the day. Um, I, I almost said just getting home from work, but like, right. you know, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. like just getting home, you know, and, and some platforms are able to, you know, put, put these quote unquote live streams in certain time zones at certain times, um, yeah. to help maximize that potential. Um, some artists are able or want to just do one thing so that it makes it seem extremely exclusive. Like this is the only time you're going to see this artist at this time, no matter where it is in the world. Mm -hmm. And so people make an event out of it. Um, but no, there's, I mean, there's just so many different things that people have done to make it successful. Some, I've seen some artists, um, do like a series where they play certain albums um oh, cool you know mm -hmm. like we're gonna do this out like one we're gonna do one live stream a week each night is gonna be a different album so you know kind of like a i don't want to say a greatest hits thing but like coming up with unique ideas of what mm -hmm. they're putting out there um so it's just look it, all it is is people finding ways to make a little to hold them over till, yes. till next year yeah no that's that makes sense um what are our ticket prices we're talking about here i mean it goes everywhere from like eight dollars or five you know even five dollars sometimes for mm -hmm. like bands playing in 250 normally in 250 cap clubs uh, all the way up to 60 70 bucks or 100 bucks wow. um okay for some people so it really varies i would say you you find the most in the kind of fifteen to twenty-five dollar range. Gotcha. And what are attendance numbers that we're talking, uh, and how do they relate and compare to what a, uh, an artist would normally do in in uh, the live the live space? That varies again significantly, kind of varying on the band. Also, you know, some artists have like a big personality and huge socials and, and things like that. And that doesn't necessarily always translate to hard tickets. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, while it might seem like a, somebody with 2 million Instagram followers or 3 million Instagram followers might sell a bajillion tickets online. Um, the reality is, is that they don't have that kind of fan basis that is, um, you know, willing to put in money. Whereas maybe you have somebody that, you know, plays in clubs regularly and has an avid fan base that buys their merch that goes to all their shows, but they don't mm -hmm. ever really sell above a thousand tickets in clubs, you know, mm -hmm. um, maybe they're going to sell three times as many as that artist with a 2 million Instagram followers. Cause those are diehard fans sure. that have been, you know, waiting to see that band. So it really, it really varies.
Is there anything that you've noticed uh, in that kind of looking at those metrics, but uh, an artist that maybe plays a thousand cap rooms when they go on tour, uh, have you looked at how it compares to the live stream space? Meaning, can you expect that artist to sell a thousand tickets or 10,000 tickets? You know, theoretically they do a 30 day tour, they sell 30,000 tickets. Can you expect the one live stream to be at that level, way below, way above? Are you noticing that like, you know, it's live stream. So you're really not, you can't expect that those, those kinds of numbers that you would expect in person, or does it go the other way that because you don't need to travel or go out, you're actually seeing way higher numbers. As more artists do the live streams, um, Mm -hmm. the companies are gathering more data and they're now having just, yeah, I mean, it's more data. It's essentially they're able to then go and collect and say, these are the kind of hard tickets you do. This is the kind of social following you have. This is the kind of stuff. And here's the artist that you kind of relate to that we've done before. And so this is the range of tickets we think you will land in. And, you know, sometimes it can exceed it. Sometimes it can be below it. But do you have those numbers you could share? I don't, I mean, it's it's a case, it's like a case by case basis, right? Okay. For certain artists and, and certain things. Sure. So, um, you know, it's, it's when an artist is going and talking to some of these platforms, they're saying, mm. okay, this is what we're kind of thinking where you might end up based on okay. what we've seen this far. And I should say that also it's still relatively new. I mean, like all, you know, they don't have years of data doing this stuff. It's (laughs) months. Months, So it's still pretty, a pretty big guesstimate. (laughs) When it, when it comes to your artists, uh, what have you seen uh, in terms of the, the artists, uh, how, you know, live stream ticket sales relate to what their in-person ticket sales look like? Um, you know, I think that I think that there's been a bunch of a, a bunch of interest in. Uh, I work with a lot of indie rock artists, so I yeah. think you know a lot of that correlates pretty closely to, you know, selling selling close to what maybe your largest market might be once. Cool. You know, and then I think I think from there, you know, you start to see a little bit of a decline once you start to try it and do it more often, but, um, but normally it's, it's right around, it's right around. Yeah. We're close to what you might do in your biggest market, you know? Awesome. One time. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, now do you see like what's happening in the live streaming space? Do you see this evolution and, and, what do you what are you noticing that is um, that is happening in the live stream space, and where is that heading? Like, how is it evolving? I don't think that the live stream thing is honestly going to go away because I think it's okay. a great way to interact with fans when you're off cycle. Um, mm-hmm. I think even when things come back, managers going to find ways to utilize that as a promotional tool. Cool. Um, you know, uh, to be honest, the live stream conversation is is being headed by and has been headed by mostly managers you know not necessarily talent agents or agencies where we are able to help with is marketing and helping connect them with promoters and things like that and Mm -hmm. um you know uh getting the word out more should an artist do that but um managers from the very get-go were you know some of the first ones to say okay if i'm helping set this up you know i'm going to go and, and run with it um it's taken agencies a little while to kind of catch up and say okay we can help out and how sure. can we help out and help, how can we help monetize are there promoters that stuff? are working on this there are promoters that are running these kinds of things they're not necessarily well yeah there are there are promoters that are running their own events and and things like that um mm-hmm. but a lot of times what you get is you know, a platform and an artist and then an artist going to, or at least a talent agency helping an artist go to a promoter and say, Hey, would you be willing to go and put this link out and help spread it to all your people in your email lists and all these things. And in turn, we will give you either a percentage or, you know, a few dollars or here or there Mm -hmm. based on how many people sign up via your unique link. Cool. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Um, in another space, have you done much with drive-in concerts? I haven't done a ton, um, <laughs> but um, there have been a few things that our company that we are, we are doing. Um, it's certainly it's certainly doing well. I mean, where people have found a way to to make it happen. Um, a lot of it is in the more jam electronic space, EDM space, okay. um, which we have a decent amount of people in um, in that genre. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's still fairly brand new. And I think, first of all, you just have people starve to go see live music. And from what I understand, I haven't been to one, but everybody that I know that has been to one has said it's honestly great. <laughs> like you get you get a bunch of people that either are bringing their own stereos because it's all connected to FM, yeah. And you know you you know you put it in the back of a truck or something, and you're hanging out, and there's like six people per car, and it's monetized that way. And mm -hmm. you know the only the only issue is is that it's extremely expensive to produce um, sure. for not that many people that can buy tickets. So that's it's a it's a pretty high ticket price. Mm -hmm. um but they're selling incredibly well because people really want to do that the question certainly they're going to go away in the next few months when it starts to get cold yeah. um but over those few months people are going to find out ways to make it not only better but cheaper to produce maximizing the potential for artists to make on it and probably figuring out ways to make it a better experience for you and your car yeah. um Cause that's the big backup plan, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. well, I'm sure there's other ones, but you know, there's, there's, uh, there's going to be a lot of great creative ideas that are going to come about to help people tie things over in spring and summer of next year. Should things not come back. Sure. Uh, I saw, I don't know, saw, you know, Metallica <coughs> put on a drive-in concert where they weren't even there. They just like, yeah. showed the video of them performing, obviously a pre-recorded concert. And they were charging like 70 or 80 bucks for people to just yeah. basically pull up and watch a video of them perform. Yeah. And I'm sure it sold extremely well. It did. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, like, but that is just the, you know, the people really want to experience that. I mean, everyone is starved yeah. for that kind of you know, entertainment and, you know, when things do come back, it's going to be nuts. People mm -hmm. are going to go crazy. Um, yes. The UK and Europe are a little bit further ahead of us in terms of their optimism. They're putting mm -hmm. tours on sale um, next year, which are selling very well. Um, wow. There's some festivals over there that are doing kind of record business on the on sales and things like that. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if they're necessarily much further ahead of us in terms of the virus or containing it, but mm -hmm. certainly there's optimism over there and, people are willing to invest in that stuff. So yeah, it's encouraging. What are, yeah. So what is the, what is kind of the day to day that you're working on these days and other agents at TVA are working on? Are you looking at next summer in, you know, Europe and overseas? Are you developing other creative ways you know, more brand partnerships with your current artists here and, and, you know, developing more live stream relationships or what is what is kind of what you're doing more more so these days well i mean we launched two weeks ago so a lot of what i'm doing is stuff like this yep <laughs> so, <laughs> i'm sure okay <laughs> um it's a lot of getting the word out talking to people we haven't talked to for months getting back you know into conversations with promoters and managers and other agents and mm -hmm. and um you know not necessarily introducing ourselves because we've been around for or us as agents have been around for a long time but introducing the company um you know uh, making sure the word is getting out about our incredible roster yeah. Um, and, and then making connections about, you know, with people that are coming up with creative ideas to, to do a, a ton of different stuff, like I had said before. Um, mm -hmm. so that's really kind of what the last two weeks have been about once sure. the kind of shine wears off in a few more weeks or months, um, then, you know, we will be getting back into the day-to-day -day booking of things. I'm, I am also still very actively booking things for next year. 
festivals are sending offers, um, you know, everywhere from small festivals to your biggest festivals, they're sending offers for next year. Mm -hmm. People are actively thinking and working towards, you know, a optimistic reality um, that at some point next year shows will come back and people will be able to, to go to them. Yeah. Um, you know, whether or not that happens, you know, we're probably a few months away before pulling the parachute on that. Sure. Um, but for right now, you know, summer mid to late summer of next year through the end of next year is, is busy. I mean, to give you an idea, I tried reaching out to get, um, a venue, a, a hold of a venue, um, for next fall in September and October in, um, in New York, Brooklyn steel. And yes. I don't think there was a single weekend available. Um, wow. so, you know, things are actively moving. People are planning on, on doing things next year. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think everybody is also sitting on a ton of artists that have a, a lot of great material waiting to be released. Um, so whenever, whenever it does come back, everybody's going to be full swing, ready to roll and, um, you know, start getting back to work again. Mm -hmm. In terms of, uh, there's a, a lot of artists, independent artists and managers who are listening to this right now. And a lot of the artists who maybe have traditionally made the vast majority of the revenue on the road touring, they're trying to figure out what to do right now. What are your, and, and we're talking, you know, small to mid-level artists. These, these are not yeah. like, you know, an artist that can charge 80 bucks for a drive-in movie <laughs> and have people right. show up. But like, what are your recommendations for these artists and these managers when they're just like, well, how, like, what do we, what do we do right now? How, how do we even get through the next year if that's how long it's going to take for shows to come back? What do you recommend? I think, you know, I, I think this is a good time to kind of go back to kind of basics of, of building a, a fan basis, right? So mm -hmm. it's like in this time, if you're not working on that stuff, Focus on gathering emails. How, how, how are you ga gathering a fan basis? How are you gathering email addresses? How are you connecting with your fans? Making sure that you're staying engaged, making sure that you're doing everything to, you know, kind of do a bit of spring cleaning, essentially, while, sure. you know, while, while you're not doing much else. I think it's important to, to have those, you know, foundations and, and basis. And then on top of that, um, you know, I, I would say going back and writing great music, you know, honing your craft. If it if if you're not comfortable with or don't have an ability to really monetize, you know, any sort of outward thing, spend this time making the best music of your career, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, sitting, I mean, if you're not doing much else, then there is no better time than to do that. Sure. And, you know, no no agent, manager, label, or publicist is going to magically make you the biggest person overnight. It's your songs. It's your mm -hmm. music. It's, you know, your art. That is what is going to actually propel you forward. And if you mm -hmm. can focus on that, then then do that and make great art because that will shine through eventually. And, you know, for the artists that might have some sort of ability to to make music, whether it's via live streams or drive-ins or, um, you know, maybe small branded events or things like that. Reach out to the people that work for you and express the things that you're interested in, you mm -hmm. know, have them go and find creative ways to, to make some money. If that's mm -hmm. really what you want to do, because there are ways, there's a ton of opportunities for people to go and it might not be the biggest amount of money, but it'll be something. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Those things lead to other things. It leads to new fans. It leads to new fan bases. It, need, it leads to a ton of different opportunities that you never knew might happen. So I would just say not to sit back, not to kind of, you know, wall around and just wait for, for you to be in a club, yep. but to find, you know, find different opportunities to, to monetize your stuff. Cool. Cool. No, that's great. That's, um, yeah, super helpful. 
Um, when it comes to just your overall general philosophy on when you take on a new client, uh, obviously things are very different now, but just in, in general, um, what do you say to the, or what, what do you kind of, where do you come at this of when you're ready to, to take on a new client and what you look for in clients that uh, you're thinking about taking on? I mean, I would say that I'm always ready for a new client. There might be times in my life that I'm busier than others, but mm -hmm. I like finding new music. Like I like tasting new food, you know, <laughs> it's like every time you find a new dish, you know, that excites you, it's the same thing. It changes your life. And there's so much new art and great music out there that I'm constantly looking for that. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, having something unique, having a unique voice and look and, and, and all that kind of stuff is exciting to me. I know it's exciting to all the people at TBA. You know, we always want to be at the forefront of new ideas and new cultural expositions and, and art and things like that. And, you know, I think that there's a lot of great talent out there and sometimes Sometimes some of it gets lost in, you know, the shuffle and, and that's a shame. But most of the time I found that really great songwriting and really great artists almost always shine through mm. and they find a way to, to, you know, through their art to, to really, you know, make it to the next level. Um, and in terms of like submitting for things or submitting to be a part of an agency or mm -hmm. anything like that, I would just, you know, I would one, I would always go through any sort of connection that you might be able to have because mm -hmm. a lot of times artists, our agents and agencies get so bombarded with kind of, um, I, I don't want to say unsolicited emails, but that's pretty much what it is. They get, they get bombarded so much that it's hard to keep up. And if you can find one person, you know, that you might know um, who can send an email on your behalf. Mm -hmm. Um, even if it's a quick one, I mean, you're already 10 steps ahead of anybody else. Cool. And if you, and if you don't know anybody, then I would say keeping your message brief and making sure that it's succinct and that you highlight things that, you know, clearly matter, ticket sales, um, streaming, uh, or maybe being on a certain playlist or have played in certain venues um and all that kind of stuff that's all helpful useful helpful and useful information for agents but i would i would definitely keep it brief because you're one of many sure <laughs> no that makes sense and that's super helpful um is there something uh is there like when you get real specific a baseline is like you know what i don't really look at an artist who can't draw uh, who can't sell a hundred tickets in eight markets or something like that, or can't, you know, sell 400 tickets at home or doesn't right. have 10 million streams on Spotify or do, are, are any of the numbers, uh, do you look at numbers like that? Or do you have benchmarks like that? I personally don't. There are some people that do. Um, but I have signed artists, uh, that, you know, had nothing and went on to, to great success. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Courtney Barnett, she was somebody that I signed that um, at the time had basically been playing in cafes in Melbourne and, you know, didn't have a label, um, had never really left Australia, had never, certainly never played a show outside of Australia. And, um, you know, three years later was a Best New Artist Grammy nominee. Yes. Um, and I signed her because I thought the music was fantastic and she put a lot of money of her own money into a great looking music video. Uh, oh, wow. That was cool. unique. Um, and you know, that's just one success story, but there are a million others like that. And, you know, some of the biggest artists on the planet were signed probably by agents who had never seen them who didn't ha had never had a chance, probably never even played a live show. Um, a lot of big pop artists now, you know, mm -hmm. they c start things online and it might be so early, but the music is so good that the agents sign it. And then all of a sudden you're, 
looking at Billie Eilish. <laughs> wow. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. Um, when when things were were normal, uh, how often were you seeing live music? Uh, I mean, two or three times a week, maybe more. Um, at, yeah, at least I would say two or three times a week. Um, so and, very, very frequently. Yeah. And what was the, um, what was, was it mostly at the time when you were at Paradigm, was it mostly Paradigm clients or were you also going out and seeking, just like checking out new, new acts that were being referred to you? Both. I mean, I had my own roster. Um, there was also, you know, Paradigm's roster, but a lot of as well, a manager being in town that maybe I wanted to develop a relationship with who had an artist playing. So I'd go have dinner, watch the music, you know, after um, every once in a while, I would go to a show with a band that had, um, you know, was just starting out um, and I would go see them live. Um, I would say that would maybe be six or seven times a month. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so not a crazy amount, but a decent amount. Sure. Um, cool. And yeah, then the rest was either my own artists or kind of networking and things like that. Cool. Um, so there's uh, there's one final question that I have that I that I ask everyone for just to uh, uh, preface this before I, I get into it. I just want to say <laughs> uh, thank you for for everything that you you chatted with i mean this has been super helpful for the artists that are listening the managers that are listening um and also uh it's just very interesting to hear from anyone in the live space uh that you know it, it's it's encouraging i should say uh to hear you know from an agent who's actually um busy <laughs> doing <laughs> shit like making shit happen which is very encouraging yeah. and inspiring uh because you know a lot of people it can be so um scary and overwhelming uh because things are so different and people just want things to go back to normal uh when there may never be getting back to normal it's going to be the new normal and you know it the new normal is going to be created by people like you who are looking at this time as an opportunity and you're not just sitting around waiting for things to happen. And so that's that's really inspiring. And I give you tremendous props for, for starting TBA and being a part of this, this new wave of what the new music business is going to be all about post-COVID. So uh, congrats on, on launching you. and everything that you're doing. It's tremendous. And honestly, it's, it's very inspiring to see. Thank um, you. Thank you. It means a lot. Absolutely. And so the, the final question that I have, um, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? I mean, it would, it is, <laughs> it, it means so much. I mean, just because this is, you know, my company or not just myself, but myself and the other four partners, it's our company and, and really all 11 of us. And we see so much potential and we're so lucky to have a career in what we do and work with the artists that we work with and the managers that we work with. I mean, I just feel, I feel so lucky to be a part of all of that and to be able to be just even, you know, some sort of positive light or, or anything like that in this time, I, I hope radiates. And, um, and I say that just because, it's so hard already to be up in the music industry. It is a cutthroat business and there are so many people that you have to go through and sometimes it's not fair. And sometimes it's, um, you know, sometimes it's not very forgiving and it certainly doesn't lend itself to people that don't have a drive and a passion and to put, you know, to make it harder uh, on top of that is, is, is worse. And, you know, there's a lot of people who are without jobs right now that have done great work and continue to do great work, um, but just aren't as fortunate as us to be able to, you know, say that they have something. And, and for that, I am so fortunate and, and grateful for. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and I hope that we inspire other people to go and pick up and, and do their own thing. Um, mm -hmm. 
or potentially one day come and join us down the road. Um, cool. And, you know, and, and I want, you know, I, I think the little tagline of our agency is planning what's next. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and uh, truly it is, that is what we're in the business of doing, planning what, whatever it is tomorrow is going to bring and mm-hmm. making sure that we do it well and that we use our expertise and, and things to make sure that it's planned as best as possible because mm-hmm. that's all you can really do. Cool. Well, Marshall Betts, thank you so much for, for coming on the show and uh, all the best with everything that you're working on and, and uh, the beginnings of TBA. We're going to be rooting for you. Thank you.